Do you see my pile? All right, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, celebration of Cockrell's Black Excellence. My name is Roger Bonacase. I'm the Dean of the Cockrell School of Engineering. Um, I'm excited to be with everyone kicking off this great panel discussion with some of our most accomplished and dedicated Black, uh, Black alumni leaders. Events like this one contribute to our learning and reflection uh, on what's important about us being a community and about how we can build a more inclusive and some supportive environment uh, at the University of Texas. Um, I wanna thank uh, Angela and Mike for the willingness uh, and openness in participating. And uh, I'd like to uh, now introduce uh, Tyrone Porter who will moderate today's panel. Tyrone is the chair of our Department of Biomedical Engineering and holds the Cockrell Family Chair for Departmental Leadership Number One and the Donald J. Douglas Centennial Professorship in Engineering. 
He joined the Cockrell School in 2020 and was named department chair this past August. He has been an incredible addition to our Cockrell School leadership team and an absolute pleasure to work with. Prior to joining UT Austin, Tyrone was an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Boston University. He received his PhD in bioengineering from the University of Washington and his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Prairie View A&M University. He is a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and the Acoustical Society of America and a member of the National Society of Black Engineers, among other professional societies. His research interests include image-guided drug delivery, ultrasound, and acoustics, with an overall goal to push the application of ultrasound technology in new and exciting directions. So I'm excited to get started. So thank you, everyone, again, for joining. And I'm going to turn it over to Tyrone, who will introduce our panelists. Hey, thank you so much, Roger. And it's an honor to be here today on the celebration of Black History Month. And even though it is March, it's March 1st, you can celebrate and recognize Black excellence year round. And so we have a powerhouse panel today of UT alum from the Cockrell School of Engineering. And so I wanna introduce them as we then get into a conversation on their career paths and trajectories. Uh, so Angela Archon is an alum of the Chemical Engineering Department and from Systems Engineering. So she has a bachelor's degree from Chemical Engineering and a master's degree from Systems Engineering. Was a former Chief Operations Officer for Watson Health and IBM. And Michael Timmons received a bachelor's degree in Aerospace Engineering. Um, and worked for CTD Family Promise, was a founder of APIS Consulting, and we were joking earlier, he also received a master's degree in business. And so he's moved on to the business side of industry. And so I wanna welcome them uh, to the panel uh, as we start our conversation. Angela and Michael. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us today and participating in this conversation, conversation and discussion. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk with other successful uh, Black professionals um, that are really leaders in their respective rights in their own fields, and then sharing your experience, experiences with our students and then other stakeholders within Cockrell School of Engineering. So a couple of questions here that I wanted to pose and ask, and then we're also going to open it up to those who are in attendance to ask questions as well. And um, we will um, touch on those as we have our conversation today over the next 45, 50 minutes. So the first question I wanted to ask here, and I wanna pose this to Angela just as to start, and Michael, please do, do share and chime in here is did you foresee yourself working in your current industry when you were a student, your current or your past industry? And how many times, if, if you've had a, a change in industry and positions, how many times have you changed company, companies and career pathways? So no, I did not anticipate that I would end up with an IT company, which was IBM. So when I went to school, went to college, I had planned on being a medical doctor. And um, I started off on that path. However, life happened, I actually got engaged to a person who was in law school. And we decided that maybe that would not be the family life that we wanted. So I decided then that I would not be a doctor, but I had so much chemistry, biology, the sciences, that I decided to use that and become a chemical engineer, especially living in Texas. So my, my thought was, obviously, I would be in the oil and gas industry. However, having the opportunity to do internships, I did internships with chemical plants, with oil refineries, and I had the opportunity to do an internship with IBM, which at the time was the premier IT company. And so it was through that experience that I said, I think I want to be part of technology. And so I started really focusing on the fact I am a chemical engineer, but I can use these talents right in my skills also within the IT industry. So I started working for IBM and I was in their printed circuit board manufacturing plant, actually developing wet processes um, for the plant. And um, my career took off from then. And I would say that 
I changed jobs within IBM every three years or so because not that I wasn't interested, but I wanted to get more of the executive general management type of skills. And so I purposefully changed every three years because I really wanted to get to know the entire business. And that that approach served me well. And eventually um, I, I was an executive there. I've since retired, but that's how I chose to uh, pursue my career path. Yeah, I sometimes feel like the students, uh, they foresee that this is going to be their career path. This is the one job that I need to select. I need to make sure that it is the right job, the perfect job. And I think you've shown that you have to be, it's best to be flexible, to be nimble and be open to new opportunities. That's absolutely correct. I mean, I've done some jobs within IBM, like supply chain. I never thought I would be doing supply chain, but it turned out to be a very useful skill as you are in business. And so, Michael, I pose the same question to you. Uh, did you foresee yourself working in this industry? And I see you're a founder of your own consultant company, so which is, you know, entrepreneurial spirit. I, I absolutely did not see myself on that path. Uh, you know, I thought, hey, I'm going to aerospace and I'm going to be working in the space industry and and uh you know dealing with space flight issue I, I did work for NASA for four years that's where I started out coming out of school um but um I ended up uh you know coming in and doing contract work for IBM and started doing some uh software development work uh which led me to American Airlines for a little bit um I did uh, some uh, they have a, a boutique consulting practice that had nothing that solved problems that were not airline related. And so I, I worked for American Airlines for a couple of years and never worked on any problem related to the airline business. And so just that taste of consulting kind of led me to starting my own consulting practice. Uh, um, you know, I, I just started it at a crazy time and, and uh, was building a house, had my first kid on the way. Uh, no real runway in the bank, but just decided, hey, I wanted to be out on my own. And uh, then 17 years later, <laughs> uh, you know, it was like, okay, I'm ready for another career change. And so, um, um, you know, but A Plus Consulting gave me a great opportunity. I was able to do a lot of different projects for clients, such as the United States Air Force. Uh, FBI was our biggest customer. So, you know, I've worked in the criminal justice space. Um, and, and, um, uh, and then when it was time to make a change and pivot, um, I decided to go back to grad school. I had an exit clause with my business partners. Um, if I went back to grad school, I could, uh, exit the company. And so I, I did. So I'm, uh, you know, my, my MBA is actually very fresh. It's 2017. So, and it just kind of proves it's never too late to go back and do some of these things. And, um, you know, during the course of working on that, I've worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield and then uh, sort of pivoted into, pivoted into becoming a chief technology officer for uh, Family Promise. And uh, um, I'm also um, in line to be chief technology officer for the next organization that I uh, can't name at this point in time, but uh, um, I do have a solid offer. But uh, also from a, a former UT graduate actually started this company. So uh, you know, things have been uh, just kind of, you just have to sort of take the opportunities where they come from and uh, just realize that sometimes uh, the path you take is not necessarily the path you, you, you expect it when you started out as a you know, 18 year old walking into walking onto campus for the first time, just showing some flexibility. So I want to dive into this a little, a little bit further. So what would you say was unique or what skills did getting a, a degree in engineering, what did that provide for you so that you could be flexible, so, so that you could be adaptable? And, I, and I'll pose that to Michael first. Uh, problem solving. It really and truly, if you really look at what the world is all about, it's about problem solving. All the great innovations that are coming out, problem solving. Every turn, everything that advances society is about problem solving. And this school is a fantastic platform for preparing you for problem solving. And that was my exact answer. I, I was saying the same thing. It teaches you a methodical approach to problem solving that can be utilized in any type of job that you're in. And so absolutely agree with Michael. 
Well, thank you on that. And I, to be honest, I feel the same way. I mean, I actually started out with a degree in electrical engineering and then went on to bioengineering, but now I'm in a position where I'm making these decisions on hiring and on course assignments and uh, assisting students with figuring out their career pathways and just trying to, it's all a system. You're trying to figure out how best to manage and operate the system. And there's a lot of problem solving that goes into that. So I would agree with that wholeheartedly. So the next question I have here, um, uh, I'll pose to, to Angela. Tell us a little bit about the ups and downs of the professional world, especially your experiences as, as an underrepresented Black professional in your industry. And there's also some intersectionality this year, right? I mean, you're, you're a Black woman in exactly. the professional industry, right? And so that has to bring its own sets of challenges. It does, it does. I will tell you uh, two things that really come to mind to me is um, I felt that as a Black female, I constantly had to prove myself to be just as smart, just as capable um, as my white peers, but also as my Asian peers. And so going through that was really um, very disheartening, if I'm honest about it, because I would see where they would be given the benefit of the doubt, they would have opportunities, whereas I had to earn it first. Um, I had to prove my capabilities first, whereas it was just taken for granted that they had the capabilities. And so they were given the opportunities to do so. So that was something to deal with. So that was a downer, if you will. The other one that significantly impacted me was that there is absolutely, um, back then and still today, um, pay inequities between males and females. And I discovered that I was being paid 30% less than my male counterparts. And so from that, um, it's not as if they come to you and say, oops, we made a mistake. We discovered that you're underpaid. It really is something that I've had to advocate for myself, right? I had to go and ask for more money, tell them I deserved it, um, do the whole analysis. So that is something that is still an issue today in corporate America. And so that was another downside of it that has to be addressed. On the upside, I will say that through these challenges, I've become very resilient um, but also I would say that if you're with the right company and it has established the right culture, then there are usually programs available to help further develop you, to give you visibility to opportunities. And so if there's a welcoming and inclusive culture, that can be an upside because you will be presented with opportunities to further develop yourself and have more career opportunities. Yeah, it's extremely challenging. I'm, I'm hearing resourcefulness and persistence and also courage. And I think that's- And I would also say, yeah, when you say courage, and it's the courage to speak out and speak up about something that needs to change. So Michael, I'll pose the same question to you. The ups and downs of your professional world, especially your experiences underrepresented. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely tough. And uh, I 100% acknowledge that females definitely have a tougher road, but it can be, you know, difficult for, uh, you know, just being African American, just really being a person of color, especially in the IT business, where it, it is predominantly, you know, you know, seen as one, one space, you know, for male, but, you know, typically Asian male, you'll see sort of the stereotypes kind of flow in there. And so sometimes you have an uphill battle there. Um, it's, you, I felt like um, a lot of times that I had to work, you know, two or three times as hard as my counterparts in order to, to, to accomplish uh, the same thing. And, but it's, I'll say this, I feel like things are getting a little bit better every now and then you do hit some places and, you know, where it, you, you still kind of hit sort of the old mindset. And some of those companies, I think they're, they're starting to struggle because they, they are not as uh, diverse and, and inclusive. But it, it just, I would say, you know, you know, it's perseverance, you know, as, as mentioned, it takes courage, you know, being able to speak up. It also takes um, uh, 
a bit of making sure that you're 100% prepared when the opportunity comes your way too. That, so that's the, the other side, because some of it is you're going to have to be really, really, really prepared. And then suddenly that one day, that opportunity is going to come your way and they're going to catch you on the right day. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened where, you know, you caught me on the perfect day and yes, I'll take that opportunity. Yeah, I want to touch on that just a little bit more. Was there a, 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 a you know, feeling of fear or anxiety when these opportunities present themselves? And, and how do you, if, if there was, how do you manage or deal with that? Well, I mean, it's going into something new is always just a little bit scary, but um, I, to me, it's the opportunity to make a difference. And so if you're prepared, and I feel, like I said, this university has more than prepared me for what I have to face. I'm not worried about being able to solve the problem. Once I can get in, dissect the problem, figure out what's going on. And that's really what it comes down to. Once I can dissect it, identify it, come up with a system and approach to solving it, I'm not too worried about. And it's just having that confidence that it's going to be okay no matter what you do. Just trust yourself. You got you got to this point through your, your hard work. You got to this university, which was a difficult road itself. And now you can stand up to anything. I will add to that, Tyrone, is that, you know, part of it as well is being accepted because I was confident in the new opportunities and accepting the new job. And I had the support of senior management who had hired me for that position. I did not have the support of my peers. And so that was the uneasiness. It's not necessarily me doing the job, but it was my peers respecting me and accepting me as part of the team. So I think trying to get through that hurdle was something that I had to deal with. And how do you get through it? I mean, you <laughs> you just live it every day. And, and the way that I found myself trying to approach it was, let me show them that I'm just like them. I have the knowledge, I have data, I have facts. I'm able to prove concepts, um, as Michael stated, right. Um, I'm able to solve the problems. And in doing so, they do come around, right? They come around and say, okay, yeah, she is an asset to the team. So I'll just add that. Before I ask this, this uh, next question, I want to remind our audience that you can submit questions through, through the chat. We're monitoring and we would love to receive some of those questions that we can pose to our, to our panelists here. So the next question uh, I wanted to pose is, and, and I'll, I'll open this to either one uh, that wants to start here. Tell us one of your most challenging experiences as a professional and one of your greatest accomplishments that you're most proud of. Um, I'll, I'll start with, I just talked about some of my challenges, right, as a professional within the workplace. On the personal side, my biggest challenge has been work-life balance. Um, as we talk about a career and you talk about um, new jobs and opportunities, I found that I was focusing so much time on my career that I must admit that I was neglecting my home, my family life, and myself. And so it had gotten to the point for me where I was only getting three hours of sleep per night. And my, you know, I knew something had to change. And so what I will say is that as I, I, I actually hired a personal coach to try to help me get through this, and I had to actually schedule personal time as if it was work time. So I would schedule time to, you know, work out. I would schedule quality time with the family. And it seems, it seems that it's so orchestrated, it should be, you know, more flowing and more natural. But I found for myself, because um, my work was taking over, I had to get serious about scheduling time for home the same way that I did for work so that I could make sure that I focused on it. And so that was one of my, my biggest challenges. Um, as it pertains to accomplishments, one that's more recent is that I was just inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Chemical Engineers here at the University of Texas. I was the first Black female to get inducted, so that's one of my recent accomplishments. Thank you. Um, when it comes to my career, I've had a number of accomplishments, but I would say that I tend to focus on fulfillment, and my greatest fulfillment has been taking care of my people 
I, um, I actually went into management only four years after graduating from college and joining IBM. So I've been managing people for over 30 years. And I have found that um, taking the time to invest in them, help to develop them into their full potential has been very fulfilling for me. And seeing them excel has been a rewarding experience because I know I've helped them along the way to, to reach their full potential. So I would say that's been my really greatest accomplishment is really helping others. Well, uh, Michael, just I, I want to acknowledge and congratulate you, uh, Angelo, on being inducted into uh, you know the distinguished chemical engineering alum. That's fantastic, uh, Michael. Well, challenges. I mean, there's always ups and downs, but I would say probably the the most challenging point in time was, um, you know, I I worked for an organization that had fast tracked me to become one of the executives but then i was taking classes at a certain level they were putting me in classes with all their senior executives but then they just didn't move anything and so um and it, the frustration of kind of feeling like i had wasted sort of three years or so with them while i was in this program but they were not moving beyond there were opportunities would open up and i was always told no no i'm sorry you're not really ready for you know, the super senior level leadership. And then once I left and found out, hey, I'm ready for the super senior leadership role, I, I jump right into it. And then just watching all of the the LinkedIn looks into my profile from the same people that were saying no, that just sort of thought, hey, you know, he'll just sit here for another 10 years and it'll be okay. So, you know, some of that, you know, some of that frustration, sometimes you have to just sort of recognize the point in time when it's it's time for you to go and move on. Um, when uh, the relationship is just not there. Uh, I have been there with where Angela has been, where I had the three hours of sleep a night um, and just um, point in time where you just get, where you're, you're old enough that uh, I just couldn't do it anymore. So uh, I had to, you know, kind of learn to, um, to kind of reset. Uh, the personal coaching, um, I didn't really get, um, a flavor of that and how powerful that could be until um, I did a program at UC Berkeley uh, last year and they assigned personal coaches to us. And then that was when I really kind of learned and appreciate the, the power that a personal coach can actually have for you and, and helping you. It's not that they're, they're, they're doing the work for you. You are setting the goals. It's just like a player on the football field or baseball diamond, whatever it is. They are are there to just look at what you're doing. You have to go out and execute, but they're there to just make sure and guide you and help you, you know, make sure you achieve your goals. And, and I found that I started really being able to really uh, more efficiently check things off the list. I've always gotten things done, but I was a lot more efficient with it and, and still had had some time left over. So that three hours of sleep, that really sounds like an undergraduate student. It's like you were living the undergraduate life all over yeah. again. So, you know, that, that's another way that UT and Cockrell could prepare you is <laughs> dealing with all the projects and the assignments and just the right. uh, lack of sleep. Um, so we got a question from the audience that's related to that. Um, you, you both have mentioned that, you know, UT and Cockrell does a really good job of preparing you for your professional career and teaching you on um, how to solve problems. And the question here is, what did, uh, what did you lean on most while you were a student at UT that helped you overcome uh, roadblocks? I would well, say- for me, Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I would say for me, I don't think I would have survived had it not been for study groups. Um, because in having these study groups, someone was strong in some subject or some area, right, that I wasn't. And so um, if I tried to go it alone, I would not have been as successful. And so for me, and then within those study groups, right, there's someone in particular that you're probably going to have, you know, a, a, a deeper relationship with, and you're able to talk with them and confiding them. And I think it's that sense of, um, camaraderie and friendship and study groups together. That's that's what helped me to survive. 
Yeah, study groups were a key component for me as well. Um, and I didn't really appreciate the power of having a study groups until really and truly, uh, like as I got into my junior year, I was a lot more active in, in studying with other partners. I mean, humans were social animal and it, it really does help to have someone there with you. But I can't underestimate the, the, the role my mother in particular played. Um, she, you know, both of my parents are educators. My mother just had a sixth sense of when, you know, hey, this is going to be about this time and a fruit basket would just show up at the right time that said, hey, you know what, I'm thinking about you, you're doing, you're doing a great job, just keep, keep sledding away. Don't worry about it, you're going to get through it. And so just that family support, it can be uh, tremendous as well. So mine was Twizzlers. <laughs> my mom would send me Twizzlers in the mail, right, and my roommates would literally just pounce like vultures as soon as the package would arrive. So yeah, the study groups and having good camaraderie with friends and possibly roommates, if you have the roommates, is yes. so, mm -hmm. so important. Um, so I got we got another one from um, from the audience, and I'll pitch this pitch this to uh, Michael first. Um, I've, I've actually been having some conversations more recently with students about dealing with or bouncing back from failures or setbacks. You know, I, I, I get this sense that you know, the students perceive us as always being successful, we're very accomplished, sort of everything has just gone our way. And so the question from the audience here is, how do you both handle failure and or setbacks? Oh, that's an outstanding question. Um, failure is just a part of life. And I think um, one thing in the sort of the American mindset is that we kind of set the stage of that we're gonna just lay it all out perfectly. We're gonna execute perfectly to plan. And you're not seen as a winner unless it, it just runs according to exactly to the plan that you laid out. And what we've actually kind of learned that is better is actually it's better to actually fail a little bit along the way and actually have little small successes, but have little failures. You'll learn a lot more and the projects will actually move a lot faster. So a whole, whole study around it called Agile Development that's basically built on trying to fail faster um, you see it is prominent in uh, Silicon Valley. You'll see a lot of the, the most successful companies that are out there. They all were willing to have little failures and pivot along, along the way. You know, Tesla was not even a, a success in the, in the first start. Um, it, it actually started as something that was supposed to be a little tablet device. And so, and then it turns out to be a car. So you have to be willing to uh, take those failures and be willing to learn from them. I, I got a chance to work for one of the most colossal failures ever. I worked, I did some work for Enron. They were one of my clients. And I always put that on my resume. I have friends that take it off, that don't list that they were ever at Enron. I said, I learned a tremendous amount about things that they did well, but also things that they did horribly. And there were a lot of things they did horribly. And so it just really helps you. It makes you a better leader. It makes you better, uh, whatever you're going to do, it makes you better at execution if you if you fall down and kind of skin your knee a little bit along the way, but you're willing to take those chances. Absolutely agree. And I was thinking the same thing. You know, we go through this in business and Michael, you could tell that you and I are both in, you know, IT because it's, as you stated, fail fast, learn from it, move on. And actually being an engineer, that's what experimentation is all about. Right, we do experiments such that we can learn and we do fail sometimes, but we make new discoveries and you just move on with it. And I think another part of it is just having self-confidence that says, yes, I know I will fail at times, but I have what it takes, right, to get there. I will be successful. I will, you know, definitely make it and achieve my goals. And for me, that was part of it as well as to have that mindset of believing in myself. And so um, I think that that's, um, you know, part of the picture, as you realize, as Michael stated in the very beginning, right? Failure is just a part of life, but you can't wallow in it, right? You have to just learn, get a lesson from it, and let's start again. Yeah, perseverance mindset, absolutely. So here's a, a follow-up question. I'm, I'm really loving these, this stream of questions that are now starting to be uh, introduced by the, by the audience. So you all have such uh, impressive professional accomplishments. This is actually directly from the audience. What still makes you nervous or anxious? Doing this. 
<laughs> <laughs> and, and I tell you why, because I know the students are on, they're listening, they're looking for advice um, and they're looking up to us. And I certainly want to be encouraging, be motivational, be inspirational. And so that makes me nervous because as I stated before, I get great fulfillment from taking care of my team, helping to develop them. And so when I think about mentoring students, getting involved in their activities, that makes me nervous because I know I have an opportunity to help someone and to maybe not to shape them, but at least influence them, hopefully in a positive way and present myself as a role model. And, and so that, yeah, to me, that is a serious undertaking. And so I want to make sure that I do it right. Yeah. yeah it, 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 you know, when you're mentoring and particularly for me, when I'm, you know, mentoring my children um, and I always tell them, I, I coach in sports leagues and things like that. And one of the things I always tell them the toughest position on the field is coach's son or coach's daughter, whatever it is. And so you, you know, I just, sometimes I'm afraid that I'm going to just expect them to just approach it like I do, because I, I mean, I've got, I've got four children and they're each very, very different. And I try to meet them at what their needs are. And so sometimes it's a, when they're close, you kind of forget that. Like if it's, if I were in a professional setting, I will take each person and really go through a detail, trying to understand where they're coming from. And so I try to remind myself to do that, even with my children and say, well, you know, my daughter, Megan, she's got more of sort of this outgoing marketing style personality, trying to understand and approach and deliver, you know, you know, recommendations to her that, that fit at this point, she's an adult and everything's a recommendation. But then, you know, my son, Adrian, who's sitting next here, next to me right here, um, he, uh, you know, has uh, different needs and he has a, a different mindset and a different approach to things. And so just making sure that I try to not uh, fit one solution for all for my kids. I, I, I do a lot better job, I think, in terms of what I do with uh, in the work office, but uh, trying to make sure I stay with that with my family as well. So, yeah, recognizing that your children have different needs and meeting those needs, as well as your your people that you manage and how best to support them and empower them so actually connects with this next question that I have for you all. Um, so we're going to pivot just a little bit. Uh, and so I'm going to pose this to, to Michael first uh, and I'll frame it a little bit. I mean, there's this ongoing debate uh, right now, and it seems to be. Uh, picking up a lot of steam, and that is this question of, you know, equity versus what is equal treatment or equal opportunity, right, versus equitable coaching, uh, equitable teaching, uh, inclusion, um, and diversity. And so um, the question I have for you, Michael, is how can progress be made towards making academia and corporate America more diverse, more inclusive, and more equitable? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, when you're starting to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, it is not an easy, yeah, I would say it's not an easy problem. If it were an easy problem, we probably would have solved it a long time ago. It, it's every situation is very different. And then sometimes it's like shades of gray that kind of play into it, make it very difficult. But I, I think um, in terms of actually listening to so i know that tenure can be golden and um and that can cause some issues but sometimes you have staff that they're just not along for the ride and uh and i certainly you know could probably name a professor or two that i would say might have been a challenge for the minority students um and i, I knew some that were you know i had no problems with but they the female students in our classes had problems with so, but, you know, there's no, pre there was no platform at the time for them to sort of voice that and say, hey, this professor might be a problem. You know, just, I don't know, maybe taking a look at how, um, uh, what's the history, what's the track record of this professor? Are the minority students sort of disproportionately failing? It may not be something that the professor is doing. Maybe it's the delivery mechanism. It's something that's not clicking with the minority students. And that's why I say it's very complicated. Sometimes, you have a well-intentioned person who doesn't know that the message is not getting through to certain people of certain groups. 
Sometimes they have a bias and that bias is carried with them in, into the classroom. It, it, it's people are complex and this problem is complex. So I, I think it's, it just really involves conversations to try to work through it and working groups and pulling people from all different sides to try to tackle what fits for the, the environment you're, you're in. Yeah, and Angela. Well, whether it's academia or whether it's corporate America, I think it starts at the top. I mean, it starts with the most senior executive and the senior management team, they have to create an inclusive and welcoming culture, right? So it's about the culture of the institution. And that starts um, with establishing company values. And these values must emphasize diversity, equity, inclusion. And so you could do that and you can establish these values, but they mean nothing unless you actually live the values. And that's living it every day. And what does that encompass? So it means when you're at a meeting and you're trying to make key decisions about the organization, make sure everyone has a seat at the table with an equal voice and an equal vote. Um, make sure you're listening to all of the diverse ideas, right? Um, most people will come with some good suggestions. Don't just listen to them, act upon them within your power. And then of course, um, Michael talked about this, making sure that there's an open line of communications so that people feel comfortable um, in speaking up and being able to share additional ideas without being judged and without any type of backlash. And I, I know that there's some controversy around this, but I firmly believe that what you don't measure will not get done. And so I think when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, you need to have some targets, some guidelines, some objectives that you actually measure or else how will you know if you're making progress and if your methods, your programs or whatever efforts that you have in place for that, if they're being effective. That certainly sounds like an engineering approach, right? You know, we, we deal, we rely on data, right? We rely That's on right. Numbers, right? And, and I've, I've done that heavily in my career. And, and I say that all the time, whenever I'm trying to get a point across, I, it's like you can't argue with data and facts. And so you're right. I always lead with that. Well, you know, there, one could argue that, you know, maybe the data and the facts for some people don't matter so much, even when it's just staring you right in the face um, because they that's really true. want to make a point uh, uh, that's going to be you know, in their favor. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting situation, a scenario. The other thing that I heard was communication and trust. There's got to be some level of trust that's established amongst the stakeholders within the organization, whether it's academia or industry. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question I have here uh, is actually from the audience, and uh, I'll pitch this to Angela first. What piece of advice would you give to a young Black student or professional? Um, I will say, I will share the advice. I just want to say that I don't know that I would just say that it's limited to a Black student. Um, but what I've learned within my career are, are two things that helped me um, that I'll share. The first one was as I went through having to prove myself again and again, being underpaid, I learned that I needed to stop looking to others to give me the affirmation that I needed. Stop looking to others to tell me that I'm good enough. Stop looking to others to decide my worth. I had to build um, that confidence within myself. And then I had to decide I'm worth more than this and I need to be valued. And as Michael stated in one of his responses, at some point you learn, maybe I need to go somewhere else to be valued, but I'm going to decide my worth. And then I'm going to seek to be in an environment where my worth is recognized. The second thing is that I was falling into this trap of what I call um, competitive comparisons. I would always compare myself to others. Why did that person get the promotion? Why didn't I get it? What does he have that I don't have? 
And, and it was just becoming disabling for me. And so I play golf. And so I finally said, okay, I'm going to look at this like golf. Yes, there are other players. There are golf players there. They are my competitors, but that's not my focus. My focus is to master the golf course. So you have sand traps, you have water, you have narrow fairways. You're trying to get the ball on the green into the cup. You need to focus on mastering the course. And by doing that, that in itself will help you to be the winner. But you can't allow yourself to get bogged down in focusing on the competition to the point that you're always comparing yourself against them. More so, look at your abilities, your performance, prepare, master the course. Yeah, and I, I think that that's some fantastic advice, and it's a great analogy, and it also tells me that I need to go on the golf course with you because the golf course is just owning me whenever <laughs> I go out there. So we need to schedule a time to actually get together on the golf course. But that that's uh, the, the analogy and the comparison. If you're not focused on your goals and you're paying attention to everything else that's swirling around you, you can lose your focus and you can lose your direction. Uh, Michael, uh, the question posed to you. Well, uh, I mean, Angela is, is spot on. And uh, what one thing I would say is that don't be discouraged. You're gonna have people that are gonna say, you, yeah, you know, what are you doing? Don't be discouraged. You don't know what you're doing. You're not capable of this. You're not this, you're not that. Uh, it's not about comparing yourself to others. It's about deciding I am good enough and what am I going to do about it? If you're told, if you're told that you're not good enough, you've got a couple of things you can do. Are you going to work harder? You're going to you're going to show them, or you're going to prove them wrong. You're going to have that data, like Angela talks about. You're going to have that data that shows them that they're wrong, or you're going to decide, you know what? There's another organization out there for me that will respect what I'm trying to bring and will take advantage of that, and will you know I'll make them a better organization because of it. And so it's always that balancing act between the two. So just, you know, I would say if I, if you know, you just can't be discouraged, just this is, you know, you know again, don't view it as a failure. Um, and it's very easy to get discouraged and feel like the deck is stacked against you. It, it might be, but just, it might be stacked against you, but just keep moving, keep moving forward. Don't worry about it. If, even if it's stacked against you, you're going to push it over. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. So I want to, I want to, probe that a little bit further because uh, your answers were, were very similar and so it's it's the um you know the the, the perseverance um um if a, and also if if a company uh you feel like you're not valued and appreciated you know you can move on so did you have that perspective when you first started let's say you're a young professional did you have that perspective when you first started was this something that you kind of grew into or was this something that was shared with you by a mentor at the company or firm that you have been with or friends? How did you get to that point? Because I think a lot of people don't walk into their careers with that attitude or that mindset. Well, for me, I mean, I know how I came into it. I mean, it, a really positive thinker anyway, but for someone who, where, where high school to me was just a piece of cake and super easy, and then you come here and then you have to reset, I had to learn how to study. And that was just a, you know eye-opening because I was just used to being the top student and what I'm doing. And then suddenly, hey, guess what? Everybody here is a top student. And um, just saying it's okay and persevering, that, I learned that perseverance just trying to get through the program, to be honest with you. And I just, I, I will not be denied is just the way I view it. And I just kind of keep marching through. It. It's like, I'm not going to be denied. I'm going to get this thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to the next thing and I'm going to get what I'm looking for. And so if you just keep telling yourself, hey, I will not be denied, you'll get there. And I, I certainly agree with that as well. I mean, I have the type of personality where I don't give up either. And I, I always say to myself, when I do fail, I say, okay, there's another way to do this. I know there is, right? And so I'll just keep trying and keep trying. But I'll tell you, when I first started working, um, Absolutely, I had to grow into this because, again, um, you know, you come in with, at least I did, right, again, with the comparison about, all right, 
sizing up this person, sizing up that person, and you know they're getting the promotion. What are they doing that I need to mimic or I need to learn? And so I did have to grow out of that. And that was something that I had to do within myself because no one told me, but even if someone had, it's still something internal and emotional that you have to resolve within yourself before you could feel comfortable and say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about that over there. My focus is here and I'm going to stay on this. And the, the second part of that, my learning was there's enough to go around. So you'll find that some people might try to hold you back or somehow I've got to go grab this because there's not enough. There's enough success to go around. And so I found myself relaxing more when I realized, you know, they, it, the pie isn't this big. The pie is infinite. There's always another opportunity. And so once I came to grips with that and really believed that, my whole attitude changed. Oh, wow, that that's inspiring, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so we have we have a, another question from the audience here. Uh, do you have an account or an example of an impactful moment, or um, let's say a, a, perhaps a faculty member during the start of your time at UT that has stayed with you for your for your career? So an impactful have, moment or uh, impactful faculty member. I, I have a funny one. Um, so chemical engineering, um, Dr. Maqueda. So the engineering school is named after Dr. Maqueda um, for chemical engineering. And I was in his class one day and I was, it was one of those bad hair days. I walked in with a baseball cap and some, you know, some camouflage on. And he was very old school and he said, gentlemen, take your caps off, let's get started. And so I just sat there, of course, and then he looked at me, I'm in the front row, he looked at me and he said, take your cap off. I said, well, I'm not a, I'm not a guy. And he said to me, if you are boyish enough to wear the cap, you're boyish enough to take it off. And when I did, I cannot tell you how embarrassed I was because it was such a bad hair day. But that was impactful to me because I thought about, you know, if you, present yourself in a certain way, you cannot expect to be exempt from the rules, right? So that's that's the lesson I learned from that, right? So if you're going to dress a certain way or have certain values or um, certain opinions, then when that is judged or when someone comes back and there are retributions associated or whatever, you can't be exempt from it, right? And so um, that was something that stayed with me for in, well, for the rest of my life. Well, for me, um, it would be several, it'd be a couple of several faculty members. Um, the late Dr. West Kemper was just amazing. Um, he used to pull me into his office and just, you know, was very, very, very one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, Dr. Lundberg, uh, who I believe is now at Auburn, uh, fantastic as well. Uh, loved the advice. If I had listened to him, I'd actually be super wealthy now because he was the one that told me I should get a law degree, get a space law degree, because uh, it's like the Wild West and, you know, you'll be the only one out there. And I was like, oh, what does he know? I'm, you know, I'm 20 something. I know a whole lot more than he does. And, and he's turned out to be completely right. Uh, and then I would say, but most of all, um, Dr. Roy Craig was, uh, I just cannot say enough about Dr. Roy Craig. He understood my perspective. He had done a Peace Corps to a tour in Africa, and he just, he brought um, just an openness and acceptingness, and, and that which just, I, I don't know, it was just such a warm, uh, you know, it, it just, one of those things that kept me going. And then just to have him, even on graduation day, you know, everybody's just, doing their graduation and then trying to get home. And the fact that he cut through the audience just so he could find my parents and actually meet them. It was just, I, I, I can't say enough about those three gentlemen. It was just, you know, amazing the, the, um, what they did, you know, and that they didn't have to do it. They just, they just did it. So I have, we have time for one, maybe two more questions here. And, and uh, we have one, uh, another one from the audience that's related to the conversation right now. 
Um, is there any piece of advice that you were given when you were an undergraduate student? And, and I would actually expand it maybe even to include uh, the, the graduate programs, post-bac uh, programs that, that you were in that still resonates with you today. For me, um, it was just understanding that great ideas come from a lot of places. And, you know, they always say two heads are better than one. Imagine if it's a group of people. And so don't cut yourself off to, you know, that, that, hey, you know, be as inclusive as you can in accepting ideas. And that has worked very, very well for me. And just try to empathize also with the person on the other side. If you can put yourself in their shoes, that, you know, you understand where those ideas are coming from and you might actually see the perspective why that might be a really great idea that you hadn't seen before. So that, for me, those are some, that's one of the key lessons that's kind of stuck with me. Yeah, I definitely believe in the teamwork um, approach. And I will also say is always be open to new innovation, um, especially, you know, we're engineers. So I know that I've heard time and time again, right, this works, let's do it this way. Um, and so the advice um, I would say that I learned was that that works, that's great, but perhaps there's a better way, a more efficient way. And so always be open to receiving those new ideas. And just because your idea is fantastic and it works, doesn't mean there isn't another one that could be just as great and maybe even better. So really being open and receptive to receiving others' ideas and actually trying them out. So I think we have, we have there's, there's actually two really good questions here. Uh, and I'm just looking at the time that we have on the clock. Um, I, wanna, I wanna ask both and, and maybe we can, we can try to give answers um, as, as succinctly as possible. But there, the, one is a bit of a challenging question. I think one is a little more straightforward. So the challenging one uh, is how do you balance the need to play the game or participate in a problematic or challenging system in order to be, uh, have a successful career while acknowledging that true lasting change generally comes from challenging these systems? So how do you balance that need to play the game to continue to advance with being maybe a little disruptive and doing with uh, getting into a little uh, good trouble, right, as if, if you will, in order to challenge the system? How do you balance that? I think it's exactly what you said, is that if you're going to challenge the system, make sure it's good trouble, right? You're doing it in the proper way, following the proper protocols, um, so we could be challenging, but making sure it's according to the protocol and that we're being respectful about it. I, I personally do not feel a need to sit silent and just let the system do what it does and just feel that for whatever reason, I can't do anything about it because there might be repercussions or maybe it's going to somehow personally impact me. I feel that it's more important to affect change. And so as long as I'm doing that peacefully and within the proper approach, I feel that I must do it. And so that's that's my approach. Yeah, I would say you good changes, you're gonna have great ideas. You're gonna have some ideas for change that are gonna be innovative. You want to try to push those. Sometimes there's not an appetite for it. Make sure you're prepared. It it's not just about, hey, I think this is a great idea and it's going to be better. Sometimes you've got to walk in there with the data. You've got to do your research and say, this is going to be better and show why it's going to be better. You're still going to get pushback sometimes on those ideas. And if the organization is sort of willing to work with you on that in that pushback, then work with them. If it gets to the point where they're just not willing to change, then it's time for you to go somewhere else. And it just that, that simple. And uh so, you know, just keep an open mind and look at the opportunity and just decide when it's time to be on the playing field and when it's time to get off. So I'm going to add to that before asking this closing question. And just from my own life experience, there, there's strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. It can be extremely difficult to push for change when you're a solo operator. 
And so finding allies and others that are like-minded and also recognize the problems within the system and working together, it's always been my experience that there is strength in numbers. Yeah, that helps. But sometimes I believe it. you, sometimes you have to convince that person that's your staunchest ally. I mean, your staunchest uh, opponent to, to an idea that, hey, this is going to be a better way. And sometimes you just have to, you just work them over until they come around and they see it. Uh, and so, you know, data, sometimes it tells a story. Some people don't want to hear it no matter what. So this last question, uh, I, I'm actually, I I'm, I'm love this question here uh, from the audience. Um, what most excites you about the future and the future of Black engineers going into the workforce today? Well, what most excites you? Just being in IT innovation. I mean, things are changing so rapidly. Never did I think in my lifetime, right, we would be dealing with autonomous cars and all of the technology that we have. Um, so that excites me that we will continue, right, to utilize technology and to make these uh, these great leaps forward with um, with innovation. Um, what was the second part of the question? Oh, and, and the future of Black engineers going into the workforce today. So um, I do a lot of mentoring and I get engaged with a lot of schools and um, I've done a lot of recruiting, if you will, and going to the schools. And I know NSBE, um, National Society of Black Engineers and the Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And I am seeing some super intelligent students and I've had the chance to talk with them. And in doing so, I'm very encouraged because, I mean, when we were in school, there was so much knowledge and now there's so much more to learn. And so the, the kids coming out of school today just have, I think, such, such a, a, a larger breadth that they're encompassing now in their learning. And I'm excited that, you know, they are going to be very well prepared, right, to really go into industry and make a difference or research for that matter. And Michael? I, I'm excited because I, I like the now the breadth, the fact that more are going into these, into engineering. I believe that uh, the, um, the more and diversity you have, the more ideas you're going to bring to the table. You're going to have things that are just out of the box. I mean, and Amazon didn't exist when we were in college. Just think about that. Just think about the companies that are around and new ideas. And they're from people from very, very different backgrounds that are the reason why these ideas are now coming to light. And so, you know, you know, this is a different time from when my grandfather was going to school. And now it's a different time. You know, it's different for me. Now that I'm really, really excited about some of the opportunities and the challenges that uh, the engineers that are going to be coming out and you know how much is at their disposal in terms of compute power and everything else it's just it's fascinating to me the problems they'll be able to solve and on that note i want to thank you both for your time your participation on this panel i want to thank cockrell school of engineering i want to thank dean roger Anakazi for his participation and attendance at this event um we're hopeful that when we anticipate that the next Angela and Michael and Tyrone are in this audience are, are attending this event and have taken some of these comments and some of this information and that this is inspiring to them and they'll become the next you know great innovators and leaders uh, either in academia or in industry. So there's great opportunities to support the growth and development. Uh, of, of these students um, so that they can go on and do tremendous and great things as UT alum, as Cockrell School of Engineering alum. Uh, so we wanna thank you for your insights, uh, Angela and Michael, and your, your participation and your continued commitment to Cockrell School of Engineering. And thank you so much um, to the audience for your participation and your attention today, all right? Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.